So thank everyone, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, this is the second seminar of the Red LHC, uh, which is one of the activities the network is doing uh, together with things like the workshop, the workshops, because there are now uh, three workshops. One is the physics workshop, then there is the computing workshop, and then there is the instrumentation workshop. So, and collaborating with Sepang in, in other activities. So today we have the pleasure to have uh, as a speaker um, Dermot Moran, who did his PhD uh, in the LHCB collaboration, um, and uh, which was, uh, let me think, uh, central exclusive production with the MION final states in 2011, uh, under the supervision of Ronald McNulty, in the uh, UCD in Dublin. And after that, he joined uh, Manchester as a postdoc for a couple of years. He also did uh, a lot of work in uh, uh, tracking detectors in the VILO, the vertex locator at LHCB, first as a PhD student and then uh, as a research uh, associate in Manchester. And then he fell in love with Spain and moved to Madrid and joined the <laughs> Universidad Autónoma and um, also shifted to CMS, uh, to competitors from LHCB. And uh, so he's now working for CMS. Uh, and he's working in two working groups, uh, first uh, with Autonoma and now at CMAT uh, from 2011. He's working in the B2G, which I have to check what was it, which is uh, Beyond two uh, uh, generations, two generations, and the Higgs groups, and uh, he is also involved with the trigger group, uh, to with the Mion trigger, and he's currently the convener of the Higgs to WW subgroup. Um, as in the bio that we submitted, he says that he's interested in Higgs coupling measurements and EFT interpretation. So today he's given the seminar entitled. Higgs boson measurements and their effective field theory interpretations. So, with uh, I don't have anything else to say. And uh, welcome, Dermot, and you can start your presentation. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction, <clears throat> and thanks for this opportunity to go over this this topic. I think it's an exciting area right now, and I I hope I can do it justice. So, we can begin. So, yeah, I just wanted to begin with going over the. The triumph of the standard model really at the LHC, I think it's nicely encapsulated in these kind of uh, summary plots, this one from CMS. So you have all these uh, measurements from CMS in the electroweak uh, top and Higgs sectors and these various standard model predictions. So these are production cross sections, I should say. And really, even this is just a, a fraction of all the measurements that have been done uh, of this type at the LHC. And the, it's, what's so impressive is that we have so many predictions and measurements that agree over really many orders of magnitude. So I would say this is a real, real triumph of the standard model. And then, as is in the title, I'm specifically interested in the Higgs sector. So even the, the standard model picture of uh, electroweak symmetry breaking has, has triumphed, let's say. It's been, it's been well established. And we have this uh, nice plot where you can see, let's say, the couplings versus uh, versus the couplings to the Higgs versus the mass of the particle. And we've observed um, the Higgs couplings to heavy fermions and, and heavy vector bosons. Okay. Uh, and also, there's more to add to this picture at, at some stage. So we've yet to confirm, let's say, the coupling to second generation fermions. So let's say muon. And, uh, and the C quark, even though we have searches for, for, for Higgs to mu mu, okay, we're not quite there yet. And there is the potential that someday we could add this, but this, okay, this is a much more difficult channel. And I think the current, let's say limit is at 70 by, 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 by the standard model expectation. And then another thing to add to this picture is the, the Higgs self-coupling, self which is very interesting because it's, it's the only particle that couples to itself. But okay, this is severely stats limited at the LHC. So this won't happen at the LHC, unfortunately. Um, and I just wanted to say that when I speak about Higgs measurements for this talk, I'll really be focusing on measurements that evolved established couplings. 
So basically uh, measurements uh, of Higgs decays with, uh, with heavy fermions and, and vector bosons. So uh, the standard model we know isn't the, the, final, uh, the final destination. There are many big questions that remain. Uh, and many of these uh, big questions are kind of summarized here. And really the issue is that they can't be answered by the standard model as it is. So for each one of these questions, there are many big ideas of what could lie beyond the standard model to try and ad address these. So I like this because this is split up by, by questions and different models to try and answer these questions and what kind of things to cover. So with respect to the Higgs, then you can think, well, why is the Higgs mass so small? There's questions of naturalness there. Um, other points like, is, is the Higgs mechanism solely responsible for electric symmetry breaking? Or is there something else going on there? So, uh, and then about CP violation, we know about the matter antimatter asymmetry. And is there some CP violation in the Higgs sector that could uh, help to address this? So yeah, uh, there are many theories then. And generally I would say that they predict new particles around the TEV scale. Uh, but the issue here is that we have many direct searches at the LHC and we have found no new particles. And this plot here summarizes uh, the limits that have been set on a range of heavy particles that we've searched for at, at, at the LHC. This, this particular one is from Atlas. And again, this is only a subset of all the searches that have been done. And this covers a number of different models and a number of different types of heavy particles. So the fact that we haven't seen anything uh, and that we know that there really should be something beyond the standard model suggests that there's an energy gap between the standard model and where new physics lies. Um, and this kind of energy scale hierarchy then motivates the use of effective field theory. And kind of this energy scale hierarchy is something really fundamental to the, the use of effective field theories. So I thought it would be use, useful then to go through uh, an old theory, Fermi theory, because this is something very similar. And I think it has all the main, uh, it has all the main kind of, uh, yeah, features to it that we, that we need for an EFT. So Fermi theory, you could say, is a, is a low energy effective theory of the standard model. Where here you can think of the standard model as the underlying theory. So if you were to try and uh, look at beta decay then with the full uh, standard model, full underlying theory, you would have a Feynman diagram like this with the W propagator in the middle and the amplitude would look something like this. So you have the coupling squared divided by the momentum transfer uh, minus the mass of the W, okay? And Fermi theory then is kind of an effective theory with respect to this, because then they didn't know anything about the W boson, right? So they just treated it as a, a four fermion interaction with, uh, with the Fermi coupling here. So in a sense, you just kind of integrate out the, the, the W boson propagator that you don't know about, and you make this uh, contact interaction. And if you look at then what this amplitude looks like, it, it's actually very similar to this, to the full theory. And if the momentum transfer here is very small with respect to the W boson, then this actually does a very good job of describing this kind of interaction. And this is really the main idea behind the effective field theory that you, you can forget about the heavy particles that you don't know about and introduce new interactions like this with particles that you do know about. Okay, and as long as the energy that you're operating in is, is much less than let's say the mass of the new particles, then this can work very well. And for example, let's say Fermi theory was used to describe beta decays and those ex early experiments with the energy of a few MeV, whereas the mass of the W is 80 GeV. So this is a huge uh, energy hierarchy, huge energy scale difference. And that's why it works so well. Um, so then based on that, you can think, well, can we do the same thing with the standard model and treat the standard model as a low energy EFT of some unknown underlying theory. Okay, so in principle you can, uh, but the issue is we don't know the underlying theory. Okay, so you can take a kind of a, a bottom up approach to build uh, a standard model EFT. So first you think about, well, what particles are, will be in this? And before you do that, you have to say, what scale is the underlying theory at? 
And we generally do that with this parameter lambda. So this is the energy scale of the, the, the VSM theory, the underlying theory that the, that the standard model is a, a low energy approximation of. And so we can say, well, we can include all the particles with mass less than this, this lambda. And really that would be all the particles in the standard model. And then you build operators, which are basically uh, like effective interactions like this. You build operators from all these standard model fields and, and derivatives. And then you say, well, what symmetries should these operators obey? Well, that's, that's kind of easy. You can just say, well, they should obey all the standard model symmetries we know about already. So that's gauge invariance and Lorentz invariance. Okay, and then finally, you can do what's uh, dimension counting to try and kind of organize all this a little bit. So every operator has a dimension, let's say a mass or, or an energy, because all the, all the fields have, have uh, dimensions and all the derivatives have dimensions. And so finally, each operator has a final dimension and you can split them up by the dimension. You can also take out the con a constant. Uh, you can split the coupling, let's say, in front of the operator into a constant and some power of lambda, this energy scale of new physics, and then organize them all like this with respect to the mass dimension D. So you get something like this then, where you have the, the standard model Lagrangian, which is just all the dimension four operators. And then you have everything above that, five, dimension five, six, seven, and eight, and, and even more. But okay, we typically just cut this off at, at dimension eight. Okay, so, th so you can start to simplify this then a little bit. You can say, well, the dimension five and dimension seven operators don't really work because they violate lepton number or lepton and baryon number. So we can kind of dismiss them straight away. So then you're left with dimension six operators and dimension eight operators. And you can see these are suppressed by one over lambda to the power of something. So the dimension six is suppressed by one over lambda to the power of two. Uh, and if you think about it, this kind of makes sense because uh, this term in all has to have dimension four, okay? Like the standard model terms. That's for, for the action in the end to be dimensionless. Uh, and here the dimension eight terms is suppressed by one over lambda to the fourth. So then it's typical to say, well, this is, uh, this is heavily suppressed and this would be the leading effect. So we can just, we, we typically just neglect them, these dimension eight operators. So then what does your standard model EFT look like? You have the dimension four operators, which is your standard model. <clears throat> and then you have these dimension six operators that essentially allow for new interactions, okay? So the effects of new heavy physics uh, are mapped onto these dimension six operators. And these uh, coefficients in DCI, they're called Wilson coefficients. And these kind of specify the, the strength of the new interactions. And there's one interesting feature here that I should uh, mention that the contribution of these uh, dimension six operators can scale as the energy of, of, let's say, the process that you're looking at divided by lambda squared, okay? So this means then that actually uh, the effect of these operators can actually grow with the energy scale of the process that you're looking at. So that's one interesting feature of the, of the dimension six operators. And again, uh, just to be clear, this EFT kind of approach is only valid at energies much less than lambda, the scale of new physics. So I think then it's, it's, uh, it's very instructive to take a kind of example of, of, of uh, how this works and what this could look like. And a nice one that I took from another talk is the example of the effect of the Z prime, a uh, potential Z prime on the dielectron mass. Okay, when the energy that your experiment is working at is much less than the Z prime mass. So let's say this is the, the Z prime shown here, and this is the mass peak, but this is, let's say, at an energy that we're not uh, operating in with our experiment. And this is the area we're operating in down here. And the standard model predicts this kind of uh, dielectron mass distribution in blue. But actually, if the Z prime is real, then it could actually affect this distribution. Okay, we, we won't see a resonance, but what we'll observe won't quite, even, won't quite match the standard model. So how can this approach help? Well, what's interesting is that, okay, this looks a lot like Fermi theory. So if you had a, a theory of the full Z prime, let's say you would have the, the, the full Z prime propagator uh, in a Feynman diagram like this. But if you're operating at an energy much less than the, than the Z prime, then you can move to this dimension six um, 
uh, effective interaction, let's say. And this then can describe the deformation that you would observe with respect to the standard model. So that's the power then of this approach. Uh, and yeah, just, yeah, I think that's the final point made here that these general deformations at the energy scale that we operate in can be described by these uh, effective interactions with the dimension six operators. So then uh, we need a list of these dimension six operators, okay? So a general list of these is called the basis. And the first complete and non-redundant redundant basis of these was the Warsaw basis. And this is a list of let's say 59 operators. And this is a very popular basis in the theoretical community. And it's becoming more popular in the experimental community as well, uh, as I will show later on. And I just wanted to give, okay, there's uh, this 59, so I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I, I wanted to give uh, an example of a few of them with respect to Higgs VV interactions where the V is the gauge boson. Uh, and the Wilson coefficients have these kind of, uh, this kind of look, this is how they're, they're written down. So HDD, HG, HB, and HWB. Uh, and then you can see that the operators then are formed from the, the Higgs fields, the gauge boson fields and, and derivatives. And you have some example of, of where they can cause deformations with respect to the standard model, let's say. Uh, so you have a number of different um, BBF production vertices here. And this one would affect the, the Higgs to gluon gluon production vertex. Uh, and obviously some of these, if you're looking at a particular Higgs decay, they will also, some of these will also affect the, both the production and, uh, and decay side of things. Um, and also I should say that these are all even and some of them have corresponding CPR operators. So this isn't the only basis, uh, of course, and I, in the next slide I'll say a bit more about another couple. But I just wanted to outline something uh, interesting uh, about, about th this Warsaw basis. So here is kind of a landscape of all these uh, uh, Wilson coefficients that correspond to different operators. Then laid on top is like several classes of, of measurements that are sensitive to measurements in these sectors. And you can see that there's a lot of overlap, okay? So what this kind of tells you is that different operators can have effects in many different kinds of measurements. And this kind of points to uh, the motivation for why it would be better to perform a, a global standard model fit to try and assess the effect of these potential operators. And that indeed is the long-term goal. So at some stage, uh, probably not in the very, very near future, but at some stage, we hope that we will have something like an Atlas and CMS combination, a global fit to electro weak and Higgs and top measurements to try and detect, let's say, general standard model deformations from, from operators uh, that affect many measurements in many sectors. So then uh, just to mention two other uh, kinds of operators. So one is the, the Higgs basis, and this is kind of different to the, the Warsaw basis. It's kind of a convenient experimentally uh, basis to express the EFT in, because it's expressed in terms of the mass eigenstates after electroweak symmetry breaking. So that's kind of convenient because it's more, uh, it's more transparent with respect to measurable quantities. There's a, there's a the more direct link between the operators, let's say, and, and what you actually see or measure as an experimentalist. So this is the Lagrangian then uh, for the Higgs and gauge boson uh, interactions. So on the top, you have a few terms for the Higgs ZZ and a few terms for Higgs WW next, then Higgs Z gamma, then two here for Higgs gamma gamma and two here for, for Higgs gluon gluon. Okay, so this, this has been used uh, in many analyses and is still used, um, but I would say that the, the Warsaw basis is becoming probably more popular because I think it's more appropriate for using in, in global fits. There's also this SIL basis, which was also quite popular. Uh, and this corresponds to strongly interacting light Higgs uh, EFT. So this, the EFT I showed before was more of a, a bottom up approach. This is more of a, a top down approach where you start with a VSM model and you kind of integrate out all the heavy particles and then you're left with, uh, let's say effective intera interactions 
like what I showed earlier, where you where you remove the propagators and you, you leave just the effective dimension six interactions. And that can be useful, I guess, because uh, there's more of a direct mapping between the BSM scenarios uh, uh, and the um, and the Wilson coefficients belong uh, corresponding to the to the operators. Um, and in general, this SIL basis uh, is generally used with, with composite heat uh, BSM models. And just to say that uh, although these look very different especially the Higgs basis, uh, they are related to the Warsaw basis uh, through, through linear transformations. Okay, so then uh, how do we actually measure Higgs-related EFT coefficients? So what's actually done in the Higgs group to measure these, these couplings of these coefficients? I would say generally there's two kinds of approaches. The first one is a, a dedicated detector level approach. Okay, where you uh, you perform the the analysis uh, as a typical analysis at detector level, so you have access to the full information of the decay. So, for example, I have a schematic here of a Higgs CZ decay into four leptons. So you have all the information of the four leptons from the final decay. If there are associated particles like two two jets from from VBF production, you also have all the information of them. And you can combine all that information to make dedicate, dedicated discriminants to try and like isolate different coupling models, or if you want to try and isolate different uh, Wilson coefficients. And also you can fully simulate the signal PDFs with this approach, okay, which is advantageous. Uh, then the other, other type of approach is uh, to interpret basically other measurements. Uh, where I'm thinking of two types of measurements here. So differential producer cross sections is the first one, and simplified uh, template cross sections. Um, and the idea is then that you parameterize the signal at gen level for the bins used in for these differential distributions. Okay, and you perform perform fits and try and constrain the Wilson coefficients in this way. So there are pros and cons uh, for all these approaches. It's not easy to say which one is the best one to use going forward, let's say for a, a, global, a global analysis. There are advantages and disadvantages to each. So I, I didn't want this talk to be just basically going over all the latest results using all these approaches. Uh, and rather I've just taken an example or two of each that I think are instructive uh, to understand these approaches and what, what's good and bad about each and one of them. Um, and all these, and all these uh, studies are, are fairly recent from, from, from one two. So the first one I wanted to speak about is STS, STXS measurements, so simplified template cross-section. The idea here is that you measure uh, the Higgs cross-section in predefined kinematic bins per production mode. So you have this schematic here for the binning used for gluon-gluon fusion production, for example. And for VBF and VHIGS, VHIGS production, for example. So uh, the binning then is motivated by trying to minimize the theory of dependence, or, or let's say trying to minimize the uncertainty on the standard model prediction in the bins. So you wouldn't have one bin, with, let's say, with a very large standard model uh, Higgs uh, uncertainty. Uh, and you also want to marry this with, with maximizing the sensitivity to, to BSM effects. Uh, there's no fiducial phase space here with respect to decay, okay? So generally, you extrapolate, uh, for each decay channel, you extrapolate to the full uh, phase space. So that does introduce, uh, I mean, that allows you to combine different decay channels very easily, but it does also introduce a significant model dependence because this extrapolation is often is, is based off the, the standard model Higgs, uh, okay, acceptance. And just to say about the binning then, the binning then is typically done by, okay, the number of jets, you can see along here, uh, the PT of the Higgs going from bottom to top. The, if there's two jets, you often have bins with the, the mass of the jets. Uh, and then this is the same thing you can see for the, for the VBF and VHIGS production. Well, okay, obviously this is always for two jets, but the binning is split by dijet mass and uh, uh, other invariant mass of the digest system, of course, and the PT of the Higgs. Okay, 
So then I wanted to go through an example of, uh, of a measurement of this SCXS um, and an interpretation of this with respect to EFT. So this is an example from ATLAS where they have measured the SDXS uh, cross sections in the Higgs to gamma gamma, Higgs to ZZ, and V Higgs optonic, Higgs to BB uh, channels. So this, these are the measurements here. Uh, and you can see the red line is the standard model. And you can see all these measurements are really nicely distributed around the standard model. So everything looks really consistent uh, with the standard model, I would say. And I would say that this is uh, split up by measurements in Higgs gamma gamma, Higgs ZZ and Higgs B bar as you go from top to bottom. I think it's probably pretty hard to see. Um, and the production modes included, uh, include gluon gluon fusion production, BBF and V Higgs, uh, and also a, a TT bar associated production. So then, so we have these cross section measurements. Uh, how do we make an interpretation in terms of a, a standard model EFT? Well, you, you, the idea is that you, you parameterize the effect of the standard model EFT on your observation uh, in, in these uh, STXS bins. Okay, so the first thing to think about is what would the cross section look like? Uh, so it will be proportional to the standard model amplitude plus the amplitude of all these uh, dimension six operators that you want to consider squared okay and when you square that what you'll get is a, a pure standard model term you get an interference term that's linear with respect to the, the the wilson coefficient and you'll also get a pure bsm term that's quadratic with respect to this uh, wilson coefficient and then the parameterization that's typically done is a, is a is on a ratio of the observed cross section let's say with respect to the standard model cross section so then you will end up with this kind of uh, parameterization. One plus this uh, interference term, which as I said, is linear in the coupling and you have this parameter AI, okay, which I'll say a little bit more about later. Uh, and then you have this uh, pure BSM term, which again is, uh, is uh, quadratic in the, in the Wilson coefficients and you have this BIJ parameter. And these run over all the Wilson coefficients for all the dimension six operators. So in principle, uh, you should consider both these terms when you want to parameterize the effect of the of the all the operators on your observable, let's say. Uh, and okay, uh, an important point here is that this CI bar here is actually CI divided by lambda squared, where lambda is the scale of new physics. So we have this linear term here that's actually suppressed by one over lambda squared. And we have this quadratic term that's suppressed by one over lambda four to the power of four. Okay, so this you would expect should be the leading term and also this should have some effect and in principle should be included. But there's one caveat I wanted to mention here. Uh, and that is that I said earlier that we typically neglect dimension eight operators. Um, and there is something to be said about this here, because the, if you imagine included in, including a, a dimension eight operator here, the interference term for that dimension eight operator would also enter as in as uh, suppressed as one lambda to the four. Okay, so in principle, if you were to be purely consistent, you really should include that term for the dimension eight operator, but we generally don't. I think, I think uh, before we had an excuse in that there wasn't a complete uh, basis for dimension eight. I, I, I don't think that's the case anymore, but there are a lot of operators. So I think it's uh, probably impractical at this stage to include them. Now, just to say uh, that the main parameterization involves assessing these parameters, AI and BIJ, uh, and they're taken from simulation at gen level. Generally, uh, how this is done is you have this EFT model that's kind of uh, implemented in, let's say, a program like Smith, Smith Sim, and this is included in MadGraph, and so you can generate it that way. And then you use Pythia for particle shower and hadronization. And then there's this, um, uh, this package called Rivet, where you can basically uh, perform the analysis at generator level. So you build the, the higher level variables, and you can bin perform a binning, let's say, into STXS, 
and then you can extract these parameters in each bin. And then you have your EFG parameterized at, at gen level, let's say. Uh, and also, uh, okay, you, you also have to think of the effect of the operators and the decay. Uh, so this same procedure is more or less followed for the decay side as well. Okay, so things get a little bit complicated here because in this analysis, they attempted to consider all CP even uh, dimension six operators. Okay, uh, all CP even because STXS doesn't have a, a binning that's sensitive to CP odd operators. So uh, in the, for, the, for this reason, we just consider all CP even. But there's really insufficient information in the STXS that we're using to constrain all these uh, uh, um, coefficients simultaneously, okay? Because even some of them are, are degenerate, they have very similar effects and a very similar process. Uh, and actually, I, I don't think even a maximum likelihood fit would converge with this kind of approach. So what they do is uh, they use the, the covariance matrix of the STXX measurements, and they do some manipulation with this to get a fissure information matrix. And this kind of information matrix, uh, or this kind of fissure matrix should uh, carry information about which, uh, let's say, observables are sensitive to which uh, Wilson coefficients. And they perform a, a, an eigenvector, get the eigenvectors of this matrix, let's say, uh, and, they, and from that, they can get the sensitive directions in the operator space. So uh, that all sounds a bit complicated, but basically they're just getting linear combinations of the Wilson coefficients that correspond better to what you're actually observing uh, and removes kind of degeneracies and things like that. Uh, and what they're actually doing then is setting, rather than set constraints on the, the Wilson coefficients themselves, they're setting constraints on linear combinations of those. So in that sense, maybe it's easier just to think of this as a modified basis. And this, this matrix here shows, let's say, the, 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 the rotation matrix for that modified basis. So along the bottom are all the Wilson coefficients uh, that are used in the final analysis. And then you have this, this is basically a rotation matrix to rotate into the modified basis that's actually used. Okay. Uh, and I think probably there's, 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 uh, there's physical explanations for some of these. Like I was, I'm more, I'm particularly interested in Higgs, uh, to vector boson uh, to case. So these three operators in the, in, the, in the Wilson coefficients are related to those, but these are, let's say, these are operators that combine uh, Higgs fields with the, the gauge fields, the four electric symmetry ratio. So this looks to me like a rotation into, let's say something like the mass eigenstate basis, uh, where, you, where you rotate into something that's more appropriate for what you observe as an experimentalist. Uh, and I think that kind of makes sense uh, if you think about it. But then uh, there's also the point that, okay, we're only fitting some Higgs information here. Maybe, maybe, and maybe this degeneracy, this issue will be uh, fixed when we consider other inf uh, information from other, from other sectors like uh, electroweak and top sectors and guy boson measurements, things like that then maybe you can start to um, separate the Wilson coefficients without having to uh, rotate into a modified basis like this. But okay, that remains to be seen, I would say. So there's another issue here, uh, another complication with respect to acceptance, because in the parameterization, uh, it's typically assumed that the acceptance uh, is the standard model acceptance. But of course, that's not quite fair because the Wilson coefficients or the operators can also affect the acceptance. And this is best thought about with respect to the Higgs is easy to 4L decay. And there's a really significant impact here because they use a cut in this analysis on the mass of the subleading lepton pair. Okay, and this, this, as it turns out, is something that's very sensitive to the Wilson coefficients of some operators. I think there's three operators that it's very sensitive to. Uh, so this can really uh, have an effect on the accept acceptance. And this is shown here by, uh, this uh, shows the 
the acceptance divided by the standard model acceptance for one of these one of these Wilson coefficients that has a particularly strong effect. So when the Wilson coefficient is zero, of course it has no effect. So the ratio of the acceptances is, is one. But you see here, as the coefficient becomes bigger, really it starts to have a huge effect. Uh, and the, 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 the acceptance can re be reduced by the 0 0.2. So this really has to be taken into account, or the, let's say the constraints you set won't, 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 won't make any real sense. So they have, they have done this in this Atlas Higgs is easy analysis. They use, let's say, an ad hoc correction. It's like a three, it's a three dimensional kind of correction because it takes into account the effect of the three, uh, the, 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 the three Wilson coefficients that have the biggest effect. And this is applied then to the ZZ decay parameterization. Uh, and so it's interesting then to look at the, the scan of one of these, well, it's one of these, uh, Wilson coefficients, the same one that's shown here on the left, with and without including this acceptance uh, parameterization. So here is without, and here is with. And you can see the effect on the sensitivity is really dramatic. So yeah, the point here I want to make is that really with SDXS, you have to be careful uh, with including this effect. Uh, and just to point out for all the other decays, this effect isn't, isn't, uh, isn't included. And uh, that is probably dangerous because it probably has also a significant effect for Higgs to WW. So, okay. Then, yeah, finally, after those details and caveats, we can look at the interpretation, the final scans then uh, with the Warsaw basis with this STXS. So these are the 10 uh, modified bases, let's say, that we end up with. And the scans are done using just the linear term in blue and the linear and quadratic term that I spoke about earlier. Uh, and I think it's worth noting when you include the quadratic term that the constraints are generally a, a little bit tighter. So it does, it does have an effect, this including this uh, quadratic term. Okay, so then I also wanted to mention that, uh, of course, CMS has its own SDXS interpretations. Uh, and this is a bit of an older measurement uh, and this has been updated now with the full run two data set. Uh, and because it's a bit older, it was using the SIL basis, which was a bit more popular at the time. Um, and the decays here that were used are, are to ZZ, Gamma, Gamma, WW, BB, and Tau Tau. And again, uh, the, the, uh, the only CP even operators were considered and just the eight leading ones. So because they were considered just the eight leading ones, you don't, you, you can actually perform uh, a global fit with just eight, and you don't run into this uh, problem of degeneracies that, that was seen in the Atlas one when they tried to include them all. So yeah, and there they had to modify the basis. Uh, and in these scans, linear and quadratic terms are uh, included. And uh, as a, well, maybe I didn't say it yet, but for full run two, this analysis is moving to the Warsaw basis. Okay, so there is communication between the experiments and to perform a global fit, we will need to use the same basis. So yeah, this is uh, one way in which we're, we will change for the for the full for the next for the next version of the analysis, and also uh, acceptance effects weren't included here. So yeah, this also would have to be included for for the next result. Okay. So then the next type of measurement I want to speak about is fiducial uh, differential measurements. Okay, fiducial in the sense that we target uh, a particular base space region that you do your best to match to the experimental selection. And why do you do that? The reason to do that is because the extrapolation then is really small and you minimize the model dependence. And okay, that's a strength with respect to the SDXS as I mentioned before, where you extrapolate from let's say the experimental selection to the full base space and, and that introduces a large uh, model dependence, which is why you see the big acceptance effect for Higgs to ZZ. Then uh, for differential, you generally you generally do this in one or two dimensions. Uh, and, and generally up to now it's been done in one. And you use variables like PT of the Higgs and the number of jets. And this is shown here for full run two for the Higgs to ZZ analysis and CMS, differential measurement for PT Higgs and number of jets. Uh, and one last point I wanted to make here is that 
the definition of your fiducial depends on your final state. So that means it's not really trivial to combine uh, differential measurements of different final states. Okay, so that's one strength that the SCXS has that it's built to be combinable, let's say. Okay, and I wanted to just show then one, uh, one differential measurement from Atlas and with that, that also interprets the differential uh, in, with respect to the Warsaw basis. So here they in this in this in this paper they they, they measured several one-dimensional uh, parameters let's say so the PT uh, gamma gamma the number of jets uh, for two jet events they had mjj uh, delta phi between the jets and I want to note here that this delta phi jj is very sensitive to uh, to CP odd operators okay so in this case up to now we haven't seen CP odd operators considered. And this analysis they can because they have this variable. Uh, and then PTJ1, uh, okay, is the final variable. So if you wanted to do an interpretation of all these one dimensional differentials together, you have to have the correlations between them, okay, because they are measured on their own in one dimension. So they have a technique uh, using bootstrapping. Uh, where they are able to get the correlations between bins in, in between bins and different distributions, and so that means that allows them to do to use all the variables in the interpretation, which is nice. Uh, and as I said, because it does phi JJ, they can target uh, also CP odd operators. So in this case, they target the A's leading CP even and odd uh, dimension six operators, uh, and in this case, they only constrain one at a time. So it's not kind of a global fit like the others. Um, and this, this plot is interesting uh, because it shows the, uh, the effect, let's say, of switching on the CP odd uh, operators. Let's say giving the CP odd Wilson coefficients a non-zero value. So for PT gamma gamma and jets, all, all, all the variables used in the analysis, you have a ratio to the standard model prediction. And you can see for most of the variables, there's really not much, uh, everything's kind of around one. So it means that the operator doesn't have much effect. But for delta phi gamma gamma, there's a large effect. Okay, and this, this supports this uh, point I was making earlier about delta phi JJ being, being sensitive to these CP odd operators. So then these are the final, uh, let's say, constraints on these Wilson coefficients. Uh, and again, just to say that they're done, uh, constraining each one, one at a time. And for this plot, only the interference term is considered. And just to make the point that they also do consider uh, the, the quadratic and interference terms, but they don't have plots for it in this paper. But when they do uh, include the quadratic term, the constraints are much greater, especially for the CPO terms. And the constraints are, are greater like we would expect also from, from what we've seen in the in the other examples. Okay, so then the final uh, type of analysis I wanted to speak about is the dedicated uh, measurements. Um, and the example I wanted to go over is this, this recent dedicated HCZZ measurement at CMS. So this approach starts, uh, starts a little bit different. So it starts with a, a general parameterization of the Higgs to VV uh, scattering amplitude, okay? So this looks quite a lot different to, to, to the EFTs we've spoken about before. Um, let's say with respect to the Higgs to ZZ vertex, A1 would, would correspond to the standard model term. Uh, then you have um, these anomalous coupling terms A2 and A3, where A3 is uh, CP odd. And then uh, there's, there's some expansion here in A1 where some of these terms disappear when you, when you require uh, certain standard model symmetries. So you're generally just left with K1 over lambda one, where lambda one is a, a scale in physics. Um, so, okay, as I said, this looks a little, this looks quite different to what we've looked at up to now, but you can enforce uh, standard model symmetries and get this to look uh, more like what we've been dealing with up to now. So in particular, you can uh, force SU2 by U1, and this requires certain relations between the the ZZ, WW, gamma, gamma, and Z gamma couplings. And these are expressed here by these, uh, by these equations. Uh, so you can also simplify this. 
straight off the bat by saying, okay, in this analysis, I want to look at Higgs disease E. So I'll assume that the gamma gamma and Z gamma couplings that they're constrained by the gamma gamma and Z gamma measurements, and they don't really have an effect in this analysis. And then you're left with just four independent couplings. Okay, A1, which is the standard model coupling, uh, A2, A3, and K1 over lambda one. Where just to stress again, A3 is the CP odd one. So this, this approach is sensitive to, uh, to CP odd uh, couplings. Uh, so yeah, so then when you implement this, okay, this starts to look a lot more like the Higgs, uh, Higgs basis EFT that I spoke about earlier. And in fact, there's a direct mapping between the amplitudes that I just mentioned and the Higgs basis EFT couplings. And these are given here. So delta CZ, which uh, maps to A1, which is a standard model coupling. And then you have the three uh, anomalous couplings, which correspond to the three, let's say, uh, BSM couplings here uh, in the Higgs basis EFT. And one of them is CP odd. Okay, so the benefit of uh, use, using this approach and kind of, I mean, uh, maybe it's a bit simpler and that it only, it only considers the, the, the couplings that affect the Higgs disease E, uh, Higgs disease E decay and also the VBF production vertex uh, and the V Higgs production vertex is that you can perform a full detector simulation for these, let's say coupling models. So you could simulate each one of these, the corresponding Higgs disease E uh, physical state you would observe for each one of these couplings. Um, but also we should consider that even for one uh, Higgs to v, v vertex, your, the physical observable, the, the cross section will be proportional to all of these terms, the amp four amplitudes of these terms squared. So you won't just have pure, let's say, you won't have just pure terms, you'll also have many interference terms, especially if you consider two Higgs to v vertex uh, vertices, like for VBF, let's say. Uh, so to get around that, obviously you can't simulate all these terms. We use reweighting rather than simulation to get all the required terms to uh, get predictions. Let's say full predictions for for uh, for these uh, for these coupling models. Uh, then another strength of this approach is that you can build dedicated observables, so you can fully exploit the the production uh, mechanism because you observe, uh, let's say the associated particles with VBF and VHIGS. And you have all the information there at the reconstruction level, and you can fully reconstruct the decay information and the four electron decay. And you can build matrix elements based discriminants that combine all this information into one discriminant. And then with these discriminants, you can, you can let's say, build different ones to target different things. So one, you can target production mode. Let's say you can try and separate VBF from gluon gluon fusion or V Higgs from gluon gluon fusion. You can target the uh, different Higgs coupling models. So you can, let's say, try and separate the standard model term from, let's say, a given BSF term, BSM term, let's say the A3 CPR term. And then you can also even try and target interference. So you can, let's say, if you have two couplings, a standard model coupling and a BSM coupling, you can also build a discriminant that just uh, tries, to, uh, tries to target the interference between the two uh, couplings. So I think again it's instructive to take an example of one particular BSM coupling and look at the two types of discriminants you can use, particularly in the VBF Higgs to ZZ channel, uh, to try and let's say target this coupling. So the first, uh, the first one is a discriminant designed to separate completely the standard model and the A3 coupling, okay. And here you have, let's say we can look at two histograms here. In black is the pure standard model, and in red is the pure pseudoscalar corresponding to this A3 coupling. And you can see the red and the black are really well separated by this discriminant. So you can see the power in this approach of separating out different couplings. And then, uh, you can, as I said, you can also build a discriminant to try and kind of uh, isolate the interference. And this is one of these for the, for the A3 again. So let's look at first the, uh, the pure standard model, which is in black, and it's very symmetrical in this distribution. 
the fewer pseudoscalars and red is also very symmetrical in distribution. But if you have a mixture, which is shown here, these are two mixtures in, in green and blue. Uh, this, so this is like what we, we would expect to see if you had standard, partly standard model coupling and partly uh, coupling from the CPR term A3. And these just terms correspond to whether A3 is positive or, or, or negative. And you can see then that this distribution is, is, is very asymmetric, okay, for these mixed terms. Uh, and so what that, that, this distribution is useful for is that if you have any asymmetry, it points to this A3 coupling being non-zero and that you have CP violation. So, yeah, uh, so that's the strength, I would say, of this approach. Um, and this is specifically looking at Higgs to vector, vector boson uh, vertex, let's say. But there are many other dedicated studies looking at other uh, Higgs vertices. And for example, the gluon gluon Higgs vertex, the, 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 the top Higgs vertex, and Higgs tau tau. And these are also very sensitive to, to CP violation in, in the Higgs sector. So then we can perform, in the final analysis, we can perform scans of these, of these, uh, of these couplings in the, in the Higgs basis EF2. And these, these are done, let's say, with, with global scans as well, that everything is frozen together. So here you have the CP odd, uh, let's say BSM coupling, uh, and CZZ BSM coupling, and the CZ box BSM coupling. So these are 1D scans, but allowing all the other uh, couplings to float as well. Um, and then you can do 2D scans, also allowing the other couplings to float. And so these are the same uh, BSM, couplings, but we've done 2D scans with respect to the standard model coupling, okay? And you see that the standard model prediction is shown in red here. So these should all be zero and zero in standard model. And the observed uh, values are shown in black. So everything consistent with the standard model. But yeah, yeah I mean, uh, the final point I think to be made here is that, okay, uh, this, this analysis is, is very powerful, but it's been done in the Higgs basis. Uh, but one point I'd like to make is that in, in principle, you can roto ro rotate to the Warsaw basis and do this analysis as well in the Warsaw basis and also have uh, constraints of the couplings, the, the corresponding couplings in the Warsaw basis. Um, and this is actually a preliminary result. I think for the paper, this will be included. And in principle, then, this could be included in global fits. Okay, so it would be one way around, let's say, compared to the ST STXS approach, where you had this issue with acceptance. I mean, you don't have this issue with, with this dedicated approach. So this would be one way around that. But it is, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, not, uh, it's not perfect either. And I'm gonna talk about that, I think in the next slide, I'll compare the approaches and give an overview of the pros and cons. And just to say that uh, with respect to this acceptance effect, as I mentioned earlier, uh, that is also expected to be an issue with Higgs to WW. And there is a dedicated Higgs to WW analysis under development, and we're heavily involved in that at CMAT. So, yeah. Then, uh, yeah, I wanted to kind of give an overview after having gone over some examples of these approaches and the lessons we've learned, let's say, going forward. Because a lot of these developments have been in the last couple of years, and there's a lot that's happened, and we've learned a lot of lessons. So, with respect to STXS and differential, and the prospects of using these in global EFT fits, I would say it's very promising and there's, there's many good things about using this approach, but uh, we have to be careful, in particular point one here, when extrapolating to fiducial regions, okay? Oh, we're often relying in this case on the standard model templates to determine efficiencies and acceptances. But as I've shown, the operators, the dimension six operators can also affect the acceptance and the efficiency. So that also should be taken into account. Uh, two then, uh, this is also related to acceptance. The Higgs decay information isn't included uh, in STXS, okay? Uh, and compared to the dedicated approach, let's say with Higgs is easy 4 l where the angular information of the decay is included. And this is sensitive to, to BSM effects from these dimension six operators as well. And also if you did, let's say for example, in uh, STXS, if you did have some bins in decay, especially for the decay variables that are sensitive to, to, uh, to acceptance effects, let's say, then you could help off, offset this, uh, this issue. 
And then finally, I would say with respect to these, it's kind of a shame that SDXS doesn't, isn't sensitive to CP odd operators uh, because that's an important, it's an important area to investigate in the HIG sector CP violation. So uh, those are improvements that could be made with respect to SDXS, including the cabins and including some CP odd sensitive uh, ob observables. So yeah, I would say there are lessons going forward with respect to those. Then, as I said, with the, the dedicated analysis, you kind of avoid a lot of these issues, but it isn't perfect either. There are issues here as well. So one thing I would say with respect to SCXS and differential, it's very easy if the theory changes to do a reinterpretation of these, okay? So th these have a lot of flexibility going forward as well. Maybe they can be used, maybe they can be used five years down the line in someone who wants to do an interpretation later on. But with a dedicated measurement, if the theory changes, you have to redo the whole analysis. Uh, so it doesn't have that flexibility. Also, it's necessarily limited to a smaller set of, of operators just because of the complication of, uh, I don't know, all the way along generating all, all the signals, having a signal model with so many terms, uh, so on and so on. I would say by, by default, it's kind of limited to, to a smaller set of operators. It's also uh, probably more time consuming and computer intensive to implement. Then uh, finally, there's kind of uh, one final point that I think is an important point and will become more important going forward is that for all of these approaches, we've kind of neglected the effect of the operators on the backgrounds. So some of these operators will also affect the backgrounds in your, in your, in your analysis. And in principle, th those should really be considered as well. So, okay, I think these are all uh, lessons that we need to think about going forward. And I hope it shows that all these analyses are really nice in their own way. And it's not quite clear which is, uh, which will be the most appropriate to use for, for global fits. There's a, I would say there's a lively conversation going on over all of this. Okay. So then uh, in, I think I'm on my final few slides now. I wanted to also mention that there are already global fits and these are done by, by theorists. Okay, so there are several theorists that are, are already using LFC measurements uh, to do global EFT fits. And there are several uh, fitting frameworks available that uh, have various differences, whether they're, it's related to, let's say, their different, different statistical interpretations, whether they uh, use linear or quadratic terms, uh, or whether they're leading or next to leading order in the, in the operators. And I've given some of the more uh, the more famous ones here, let's say, that are being used a lot. And in principle, uh, they can take take measurements that we've provided from the experiments. It's a statistically independent measurements where we have, as part of the result, uh, included correlation information. Uh, uh, let's say we've published the covariance matrices so they can use these measurements in their interpretations. And it's not just LHC uh, information, there's a lot of non-LHC constraints from, from LEP and Tevatron. And there's all, already uh, many examples of, of these kind of global fits. And I just wanted to show a couple. So this is one uh, an example, a recent example of a global fit from using FitMaker. Uh, and they use data uh, or measurements from the LHC in the top Higgs, Dye boson and electroweak sectors, and they include these, and it's in terms of their Warsaw basis. Uh, and I should say this is just done using linear, linear terms. They've neglected quadratic terms in this. Uh, and okay, this is uh, the constraints then on many of these Wilson coefficients. Um, and the constraints are split up by using, let's say, different measurements. So in yellow, they use uh, Electroweak, Diboson, and Higgs. Okay, so these are used here in these sectors, in these uh, for these um, uh, coefficients corresponding to electroweak, uh, bosonic, and Yukawa, uh, uh, let's say, coefficients. And then you have uh, uh, electroweak and, and top uh, measurements used for these particularly uh, top related coefficients. And then in red is a combination of everything. So that's really nice to see this kind of, uh, to see this kind of global fit. Um, and the, the, the measurement standard that have been used from on the Higgs side 
are okay. It's not at, from one one they're using the signal strength measurements. From one two they use uh, generally STXS measurements, except for the HWW. Here they use the Higgs to WW differential measurement because we have a one two Higgs to WW uh, result. So this is used in that case. Okay. Um, then I wanted to show another global fit, which is a, pro a projection actually to high luminosity LHC and also a number of potential future uh, experiments. And this is done with HEPFIT. So the measurements they've used are projected uh, Higgs, Diboson, and electroweak measurements from these future experiments, let's say. And this is done in the SIL basis. Um, this also uses just linear terms, okay? So the quadratic terms are, 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 are neglected, let's say, in this case. So here you have the bounds set uh, on these coefficients in the SIL basis, or in gray is the high luminosity LHC. And then you have all these other uh, combinations of high luminosity LHC plus some potential future experiment. So you have, let's say, ILC here, click and, and FCC uh, under different running conditions, okay? Uh, so yeah, uh, what other thing can I say about this is that these fits are global, okay? And it's hard to see, but okay, the main histograms are global, but also shown by, uh, by oh, here, by these kind of Ts are single operator fits, okay? And in many, cases, there's quite a large difference between the global and the single operator fits. Okay, and that, that points to large correlations between them, which I think uh, we would have expected from some of the results shown by Atlas already. Okay. And then I also wanted to show uh, some projections that we have for the dedicated Higgs to ZZ uh, analysis at DMS. So these are the run two, uh, two dimensional constraints that I showed already. And this is then uh, an example of what we might expect from the high luminosity LHC with 3000 angle strength of bounds. Uh, unfortunately, they're not on the same scales, X and Y. So you have to do a bit of work to compare them. But yeah, okay. And I think that was my final slide. So just to say in conclusion, that uh, given that there is an apparent, at least energy gap between standard model and new physics, uh, at the LHC, I would say an EFT approach is well motivated. Um, also, the long term goal would be to do something like a global fit between Atlas and CMS, this is planned uh, with measurements from Electroweak, Higgs, and Top to detect standard model def deformations. And I focused on the Higgs measurements and, and what's been done in the Higgs group. So there are a number of of types of measurements that could be exploited in such a global fit. So SDXS, Viducial Differential, and the uh, dedicated detector level analysis. So I hope I give a good impression that there are really uh, positives to all of these and that the current discussion is ongoing about how this will go forward and what we will actually do. And many of the, I've tried to go over many of the recent developments um, and yeah, I hope I convey that it's a exciting and fast moving area. And uh, yeah, watch this space. Okay, thank you very much, Dermot, for your nice talk. Um, if there are any questions for Dermot, uh, Sven, Sven has a, a question, has raised his hand. This is the procedure. Hi. Yeah. Thanks for this uh, interesting, nice overview that you gave. Uh, I have one comment and one question. Maybe first the comment. Um, I think taking into account the quadratic terms but neglecting dimension eight makes limited sense at best. Yeah, mm -hmm. and even drawing conclusions saying, yeah, here we get tighter constraints or so, I think this is, uh... <sighs> you are obviously not take into account something that has the same size of effects that you're looking at. So yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I, you I, said I it yourself. To, yeah, I, I tried uh, to give that caveat. I mean, yeah, 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 I, yeah. I, mean, I agree. I think that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. 
But uh, my question goes to the part of the bit where you looked at, I think, only eight operators, and then um, for the Higgs, yeah, I think page 24 or something like this. Yeah, I think this is the um, Atlas. Oh no, this is the end. Yeah, yeah this, this one, for example. Um, this looks for me, to me, uh, quite close to the old Kappa framework, mm. yeah, where you effectively can match one Kappa with one of these operators. What do you learn on top of this by going to the EFT analysis here? I mean, especially going forward, it's a, it's a much more general approach and would allow you to link observables from different areas. This, uh, yeah, I... And, and also to take into account shape effects rather than just, just standard normalization. Okay. Uh, scales. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's also a, a, a made, well, probably one of the. Are they taken into account yet, or this is more for the future? The shape, Sorry? The shape effects, are they taken into account? Yeah, or sure, I sure. Yeah. I mean, essentially, yeah, because, uh, uh, yeah, with, with, with the, let me think, with the, yeah, with the differential analysis, I, I would say you're taking into account shape effects. Okay, very good. Thanks a lot. Good. I think we have another question from Herman. Yes, hello. Very, very nice talk. And I have a question because you mentioned that the, the HIST basis is closer to what you are uh, measuring at, at, at the experiment. Hmm. But uh, nowadays, the, the Warsaw, Warsaw basis is used as, as a standard. So of course there is a linear transformation that uh, moves goes from one to another. But at some point you also use a modified Warsaw basis. Mm -hmm, yeah. So there is some reason behind this preference, or, or is just a convention? Or... Well, I, I I would say this is a little bit split between the two experiments at this moment. That th this this was an approach that was done at Atlas. Uh, Whereas the dedicated approach in CMS uses the Higgs basis. And this, I, this is very interesting, I think. And I think they, their, their intention here was to use a general Warsaw basis such that it could easily be combined with other measurements. But in the end, because they're not combining with other measurements, they're only using Higgs measurements. They still end up doing something like, to me, it looks like combining into, uh, into something like a Higgs basis. But in principle, maybe maybe when 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 it comes to the stage of combining this with other measurements, maybe the degeneracy then with, between the uh, amongst the different uh, operators is removed, and this this approach of modifying the basis might not be needed. So you you think that at the end you will use you will prefer also the Higgs basis? Are you moving in this direction? I, no, I think the direction is towards the Warsaw basis. The, the other yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Anyone else uh, wants to ask a question to Dermot? There is a no yeah, Begonia. Uh, yes. Hello. Hello, Dermot. Okay. Thank Hi. you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. And yeah. Uh, okay. Could you like to switch on your camera? <laughs> ah. Okay. That way we so... is more is more human because. Yeah, it will be human because I am in the kitchen. So very <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, thank you very much, Dermot, for this uh, very very nice talk. I really appreciate it. Uh, in this slide that you were before twenty four and also I think twenty three with the uh, yes CMS and Atlas results on this uh, or measurements on this. Uh, coefficients. Uh, there are a few which move away significantly, at least in the CMS case, from the standard model uh, uh, prediction. Are they, I, I can imagine some of them can move away. I mean, not all of them are going to be spot on. But uh, are they related or are they coming from say, the same measurements or uh, so correlated? You mean like this? Yes. Well? Yeah. Ah, yeah. Okay. So yeah, uh, so, and the other ones. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So what happens here, I think, is that there's a. So this is a scan of one coefficient, let's say, and there's two minima. 
And I think the reason for, I think for this one and maybe a couple more here, the reason for the minima is that sometimes there's some degeneracy uh, with the sign of the coefficient. And you end up with, when you do the scan, you end okay. up with the double minima. Mm. Okay, okay, yeah. I see. And I think, well, for, for the CMS ones, I think that's the case. For the Atlas one here, I don't think that's the case for this one because when I check the expected uh, the expected result, it's just uh, one minimum around here. So maybe there's some statistical fluctuation here or something that produces two. I'm not sure about that one. Okay, uh, and yeah, okay, thanks. Related to this, you said uh, that when you turn, uh, when, when you take into account the quadratic term, uh, you, you put more restrictive uh, limits or constraints. I would say generally it's more constrained, yeah. Yeah, I, I, uh, I would also th uh, think so because somehow you are sensitive to the resonance itself and not to the interference region. So, I mean, if you see something, it's more clear or you see a deviation in, in the form of a resonance, uh, it's more clear rather than if, rather than if you see a deviation without any shape or... Yeah, I, 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 think, I think it makes sense that it would be mm -hmm. more constrained, yeah. Okay, okay, so thanks a lot. Okay, thank you, Begonia. There is another question from Maria. Yes, thanks. Yeah, thanks everyone for this uh, super talk. Indeed, I enjoy it a lot. I have a question regarding the HZZ analysis. Yeah. Uh, how exactly do you build the uh, D discriminants? Uh, how is that? From, yeah. Okay, so maybe I'll go back to where was this? Okay, so yeah, you kind of, okay, so you have, let's say, you can reconstruct the four vectors for the final state particles, let's say. Then you can, uh, you can basically calculate the matrix element under the assumption that that's a Higgs boson for that decay. You can do the same thing for the production vertex. You can do the same thing assuming it's a standard model Higgs or a, a, a Higgs corresponding to a BSM coupling. And so then you have these different matrix elements, which are basically like probabilities that it's a, a standard model Higgs or a, or, or a BSM coupling Higgs. And from those, you can build a discriminant. Okay, so you make use of different, um, also kinematic uh, variables. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, yeah. I would say this matrix element support kind of summarizes the, the kinematics or, or the reconstructed kinematics. Um, it's, it's kind of like a multivariate analysis. Okay. Yeah, it's confusing the name to me. That's why, you, mm. yeah, okay. Okay, okay. Uh, I was unfair to Begonia because I asked her to switch on her camera and <laughs> not to Maria. But... Yeah, sorry. <laughs> ah, okay, nice to see you, Maria, in a, such a beautiful landscape. <laughs> um, I don't know if there are further questions. I don't see any hands raised. We've gone uh, beyond a little bit the time that we can allocated for these seminars, which was about an hour. We've been uh, one hour and 10 minutes. Oh, sorry. I thought it was No, too it's, it's okay. It's okay. I think it was very interesting. But I think we, we can stop it here. It's, uh, it's a pity that you are not in one of the institutes and then we should go for uh, wine and cheese and oh. enjoy. That would be great. Uh, the more informal discussion, uh, hopefully yeah. this will be happening soon. Another in time. Formats. Okay, so if no one else has no further questions, we thank Dermot for his nice uh, presentation. And I um, uh, ask you to keep tuned because there will be, as I said, the 18th of June, uh, another seminar of this series. Um, thanks to everyone that is thanking over the chat. You can all also do it by clapping using the reactions icon, for example. Um, and hope to see you soon. And maybe we stop it here. Thanks. Bye. 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 Okay. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.